please! There's no time! Welcome to Rock Paper Shotgun, or as everyone seems to say in Baldur's Gate 3, well met. As long as PAX East has not fallen to the coronavirus, by the time you watch this video, Baldur's Gate 3 will have made its public debut. You will know that it looks like this, and has ditched real time with pause combat for turn based fights that move like this. And most importantly, you can push tiny villains off very tall pillars. Baldur's Gate 3 is a love letter to Dungeons & Dragons, a game that tells an epic story, responds to your creative thinking, and loves the drama hidden in the roll of a die. This is new Baldur's Gate 3 gameplay, and I'm breaking it down based on a 3 hour demo I saw, and info I extracted from Larry and studio head Sven Vinka using a brain burrowing tadpole. Vinka, incidentally, is a man who failed so many dice rolls in our demo, he was forced to run from battle and attack his pursuer by throwing his own boots at their head. As he told us after the battle, I threw my boots and killed the guy. How happy am I? If you like the sound of a game where you can do that kind of thing, keep on watching. Oh, and do ask any questions you have in the comments, and I'll see if I've got any answers. Onwards! Ever since it was announced, fans speculated if Baldur's Gate 3 would return to its static isometric roots or riff on Larian's Original Sin series. As you can see, it builds on Original Sin 2, but with big structural changes torn from the D&D 5th edition rulebook. Let's start with combat. It's simultaneous turn-based, which means everyone on one side moves and then everyone on the other side moves, instead of switching between individual goodies and baddies, as in Original sin. Which side starts is determined by initiative. Extra embarrassing when our brave heroes lose out to a sentient blancmange. Team grouping allows far more interplay between heroes and their powers, as you discover synergies or set up a domino rally of pain that isn't possible when monsters can move before your next character's turn. A rogue might sneak up and shove a sniper so they land near their friends. Next up, the wizard conjures a puzzle of grease under that group, knocking some of them down. Now our cleric picks off a goblin tracker who avoided the grease, and then we're back to the rogue to pin down the warg so it can't run up to us. Just like that, a considerable threat is stalled. It's faster, and this allows bigger battles as a result. I mean, just this fight here would have dragged on for half an hour in Original Sin 2. Oh, and in four-player co-op, each hero is controlled at the same time within the turn, so you don't have to politely wait in a queue anymore. To see what you actually do in combat, let's take a look at the hotbar and all the things that is pilfered from D&D. Here are your basics, your main hand melee, and your main hand range. Thunk. Then there are class specific moves like this rogue's pin down which is good for stapling creeps to the floor. The next 8 actions every character can do. This is dip for dunking weapons in nearby elements, giving you a burning arrow for example which is good for blowing up nautiloid goo. Throw is how Sven chucked that boot, sadly no footage, but with a strong enough character you can also throw NPCs around, which is good for hurling wounded teammates out of danger. You can also throw vials that leak whatever liquid you've stored inside. Again, no footage of knock unconscious or help, so here's some sleepy bear instead. Help is used to assist characters who are prone, down, asleep or instead, while knock unconscious is the exact opposite, obviously. Dash extends your movement range, which is good for getting a gith yankee warrior right into the mix, where her attacks of opportunity can kick in. This next one is for hiding and attempting stealth, which I'm going to explain in a bit more detail later, so don't let that thought sneak out of your head. Then you have shove, which was the instant crowd favourite in our demo. Get behind an enemy high up and you can punt them to their doom. It's a great way to announce yourself in combat. 
finally everyone can jump, and isn't it nice not to rely on gloves of teleportation to explore the world? Of course, jump from too high and you risk shattering your ankles and going prone, although we did see Feather fall in our demo, letting characters float down from great heights. In fact, there is way more verticality in Baldur's Gate 3 as a result of jumping and climbing. I particularly love this later castle where you prance around on the rafters while goblins swarm underneath. Battlefields are way more interesting than anything in Original Sin 2. We then get to character, race and class specific moves, the neck bite of our vampire spawn hero, or sneak attacks granted by being a rogue. All characters also get a regain HP move that they can perform out of battle once a day, useful if you are in a dungeon and can't set up camp. Above these is the yellow movement bar, now walking doesn't cost action points which lets you set up desirable angles of attack. One cool tweak is that you can climb waist high ledges to get around the battlefield. In our demo Sven piled up crates to make stairs which he then climbed to get a height advantage. How cool is that? As well as moving you have one action point to spend a turn, although you also have a bonus action point for performing simpler moves, like leaping a wizard friend to help split up the party a bit. Stick all Baldur's Gate's violent verbs in a blender and the soup that comes out the other end is totally distinct to Original Sin's sauce flavoured smoothie. So much more focus is on physically controlling the battlefield leaping to the high ground, shunting enemies together, or lurking in the shadows waiting to strike. The addition of a percentage chance to hit may give you the cold sweats of XCOM RNG, but at least Baldur's Gate 3 is open about its cruel maths. This box shows you under the hood every dice roll and equation that govern the outcome, and there's always a chance you'll roll a 20 for a critical hit and get one of these slick cinematic takedowns. Sometimes the die is on your side. If it isn't on your side and health drops to zero, you don't die on the spot, but are downed. In this position, you're basically bleeding out, making life-saving dice rolls at the start of every turn. Roll above a 10 three times and you'll gain one hit point and get back up. Roll a 10 or under three times and you're dead for good. Even worse, any damage while you're downed also counts as one of those failures. So this scumbag keeping his witch bolt electrocuting our downed wizard is really driving him to the grave. It's an unbearably tense moment. Be honest, is it a surprise to see Larian going turn-based? Probably not. What I wasn't expecting was the option for turn-based exploration. Hit spacebar outside of a fight and you're in turn-based mode. Time freezes and lets you perform moves that might be too fiddly in real time. Think sneaking, dodging danger, or trying to get a damn rat to stop moving so you can talk to it. This mode gives you six seconds of movement and then the world gets six seconds. Here our hero foolish activates fireballs, but by freezing time he can jump out the way. On the room's turn, the magma glides safely by. Exit the mode and you see how nightmarish this place should actually be. Now, for me, its biggest potential is stealth, as you lock enemy vision cones to take careful steps. Sneaking like this in Original Sin would take a whole lot of quick save and quick load to pull off viewers of our Let's Play Divinity series will angrily agree. With so many powers at our disposal, it makes perfect sense for Larian to let us wield them like a scalpel. Oh, and it won't mess up multiplayer. If one player wants to activate turn base nearby, the party has to agree first. If you split apart, it won't affect you, as it only freezes time in the zone directly around a character. Of course, enter that zone, and you will have to take things six seconds at a time too. I cannot wait to try this for myself. Self. I touched on sneaking there, this is another big improvement. As per D&D rules, your ability to hide is dictated by the amount of light around you. Crouch in shade and you're lightly obscured, with a faint chance to avoid detection. Out in a clear area, you're spotted the second a red view cone touches you. But if you can find full darkness, you can have some fun. And if you can't find full darkness, you can snuff out candles to create shady hidey holes. I mean, it's cool enough that Larian are reviving Baldur's Gate. They didn't have to go and remake Thief as well. 
Of course, you still have dark vision to worry about. Does anyone remember if skeletons see in the dark? Gulp. Combine this with enemies on interesting patrol routes and arenas where you can sneak to a height advantage or to a spot to push a man off a cliff, and stealth has much more going for it in Baldur's Gate 3. Finally, an RPG where a rogue can be a proper rogue. I keep mentioning dice, and obviously those virtual roles mainly happen off screen, but I love the moments Baldur's Gate 3 openly embraces them. As you explore the world, you're constantly triggering passive checks, these hexagonal prompts that tell you your stats are being judged to see if you can trigger a discovery or bonus action. Characters' stats are broken into abilities, and under those come a range of sub-skills used in these passive checks. Your nature skill lets you spot a boulder that can be moved. Perception might spot a poison vent that you can then block with a jar, or find a dirt pile hiding a key item. Sven says that when you play D&D with a good DM, they're rolling the dice all the time, and you don't always know what you are and aren't triggering. These passive checks reflect that sense of sudden discovery. Fail one with one character, and you can bring another over to see if they fare better, although you can basically end up with a big gang of characters not seeing a button, which is kind of hilarious. And I love the idea that if you mess passives up with everyone, you'll never know what you missed. You could skip entire areas hidden behind secret doors, or never find the switch to open a treasure-filled room. It gives the feeling that the world is heaped with surprises just below the surface. As well as passive checks, you have active checks, moments in cutscenes where you roll a die to decide the outcome. Perhaps you're trying to convince a door guard that you're his friend, the one you've just killed with an arrow. You sound a bit shaken, boss. Hang on while I find the key. Or it could be forming an idle thought in your own character's head. Here we roll an intelligence check to try and imagine murdering our vampire master, for example. The tricky bit is that you don't get to see what number you need to roll until you commit to a course of action, which raises the stakes and injects real drama into the moment. Our demo became a brilliant spectator sport as we got invested in every roll. You should have heard us when we successfully rolled a check to drink blood from a party companion, but then had to roll a hard a check to stop him from sucking her dry like a toddler with a Capri Sun. One bad roll and we could have killed Shadowheart for good. Instead, we woke up the next morning with an attack bonus from our full tummy and tried to blame Shadowheart's paleness on another illness. We were not playing as a nice vampire. The vampire in question is Astarian, technically a vampire spawn, a slave to the real deal. As a vamp, he can't touch running water. Running water. Better not push my luck. Forcing him to do his best Frogger impression. And he can't enter buildings without an invite. Can he actually get through Baldur's Gate? I mean, I guess we'll find out. Normally, he's not hot on sunlight, or rather, he's too hot, but he can now get a tan, thanks to an illithid tadpole inserted into his head. This is the narrative hook for the game. Whoever you play as is kidnapped by mind flayers and has a tadpole in their skull. Bad news, unless you begin to enjoy the power it appears to unlock in you. You're free to create a character, selecting a background race and sub-race, all influencing stats and skills. Perhaps an Asmodeus tiefling with their hellish resistance to fire, or a halfling who can hide behind larger enemies, or a half-elf with natural strength against charms. Sven lists human githyanki dwarf, elf, half-elf, half-drow, and halfling, and says more will be announced. Having to then pick a class is a big change from Original Sin 2. In that game, anyone could become anything. Classes here limit a character's move list, but it's also the specific skill sets that lead to such neat cross-pollination on the battlefield. You can also pick a pre-made Origins character. Astarian here is one of five in our demo, and there are more to be announced. Very quickly, you've got Gale. I'm Gale. Well met. He's your go-to wizard for greasing up goblins and firing magic missiles. Now, apparently, he's got a magic bomb inside him, which sounds rough. Then there's Shadowheart, a cleric, whose voice really reminds me of Yennefer in Netflix's Witcher series. You can call me Shadowheart. And she shares Yennefer's love of exploding things with magic. 
Lysel is a Githyanki fighter. Now, Githyanki were once slaves of the Mind Flayers, which makes them super grumpy and say things like, You've but one chance. Join me or die. She seems nice. Finally, there's Will, who we only saw briefly blowing a massive horn. Sven says Will uses a mechanic he's wanted to do ever since Original Sin 1, something we've never seen before. I'll be very sad if it isn't horn related. As in Original Sin 2, the origin characters you don't play as become potential companions as you meet them in the story. The best way of bonding? Setting up a camp. This seems as good a place as any to make camp and rest. <laughs> Might as well adapt the daywalker's ways. <laughs> As in the original Baldur's Gate games, resting has a practical use. It'll heal and restock your spells. You see, magic users need to snooze to earn them back. But camp is also a place to socialise, altering your standing with companions as you do or don't impress them in conversation. This self-contained camp hub is also where you leave companions you aren't using and swap them in and out. But it's also a chance to unpick your own backstory. In these camp scenes, we watch Asterian wrestling with the memories of his vampire master and struggling with his own bloodlust for his party. It's a great showcase for these cinematic scenes that are being created for each origin character, with help from ex-Telltale staff interestingly. It's much more immersive than endless paragraphs of static exposition in Original Sin. That thou art mine. I'm weary of this becoming a list of ways Baldur's Gate 3 is better than Original Sin 2. I mean, to be fair, that game is the rock-solid foundation on which Larian are building lots of weird D&D systems. As Sven tells me, it's also about taking environmental shenanigans of Original Sin 2 and translating them into D&D rules. They may not originate in D&D, but they feel like a good DM reacting to creative player choices. You feel this when you fire a scorch arrow at an oil barrel to start a blaze, or drop a puddle of grease and ignite it with a burning cantrip, or more regretfully when Gale used a firebolt on oil and blew his own body halfway across Faerun. And I love the moment Sven spotted unanimated skeletons and looted them, placing their swords far away just in case they came back to life. When they did come back to life, they could only wave their bony fists at us. And then there are the ideas that remind you what a similar wavelength Faerun and Rivalin are actually on. Take for example the Amulet of Joy and Sorrow that grants the power to speak to the dead, like Divinity's spirit vision, but limits you to five questions, turning ghostly chats into an urgent puzzle. The corpse stared at me, waiting for my questions. And I can't wait to find out more about this guy, Raphael, a demon who whisks you to his house of hope and starts talking about making deals. If you saw my recent video on the Descent to Avernus D&D book, link in the top right now, I did ponder if diabolical demon deals might appear in Baldur's Gate 3. I wonder what he'd accept in exchange for removing a tadpole. But let's leave that for another day. I've got a lot more to say about many things in Baldur's Gate 3, but I also need to go to bed at some point. My main takeaway from everything I saw and heard is that Larian have sort of done what Bioware did with Baldur's Gate in 1998. They've taken a rulebook and translated it into a game. Mechanically, it's far from a continuation of Bioware's work, but neither is it just Divinity Original Sin 3 with a few friendly D&D faces crammed in, like Follow here. Ah, my good friend. You were at the gates just now, no? When the goblins came, you saw them up close? A few questions, if you please. I think people expected one or the other, but I'm pleasantly surprised at how it tries to answer questions on its own terms. And we really have only scratched the surface, I've got a lot more information to come, so please do subscribe to the channel and select the notification bell so you don't miss them. Baldur's Gate 3 is out this year in early access, and Sven tells me it'll be Act 1A of the game which will be bigger than the Fort Joy segment released during Original Sin 2's early access. Everything in today's video came from that section. but. 
that's more info for another video. Please do give this a like if you found it interesting and put your questions in the comments. I'll see if I've got any answers. I'm incredibly excited for this one. I hope you are too. And thanks for watching Rock Paper Shotgun. I will see you again soon.